Well, we're going to be doing a rapid fire round with Sindhu coming up soon. That's a big one. What great advice from Sindhu there, guys. Welcome, folks, to the Reverse Scoop Podcast. I'm your host, Nabil Khan, and today we're in for an extraordinary conversation with a remarkable individual who has not only left an indelible mark in the world of cricket, but also has showcased remarkable leadership, multitasking abilities, and an unwavering passion for the game. Our guest today is the USA Women Cricket Team Captain, Sindhu Sriharsha, who's a true game changer from playing street cricket in India to captivating the USA Women's Cricket Team. Sindhu's journey is nothing short of captivating. What makes Sindhu truly exceptional is her ability to juggle multiple roles, work, leadership, mom, and professional athlete. Her story isn't just about cricket. It's a testament to determination and family support. We'll dive deep into her cricketing journey, experience her her representing India, explore her experiences representing India and the USA, uncover the challenges she's conquered as a leader and learn how she manages the demanding roles of her life. But that's not all. Sindhu is also a driving force behind women's Cricket in the USA, a nation with only 300 female players. She's on a mission to change that with her being a co-founder of Aspire Cricket. So we're going to discuss the growth of the female game. And without further ado, let's welcome Sindhu Sriharsha to the show. Sindhu, it's fantastic to have you here. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Nabil. Thank you so much for inviting me on this podcast. Looking forward to this chat. Absolutely. Yeah, same here, Sindhu. And I've been actually looking forward to it all week. I have some fan questions. I have some community questions. I want to talk to you about Aspire Cricket, you know, what you're doing to grow the female game in the U.S., your cricketing journey, obviously. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about that. So let's start off there, Sindhu. I want to obviously talk to you about your early cricketing days in India. You know, you grew up playing street cricket on the streets. And so how was that your first taste of cricket from an early age or was it even prior to street cricket you were doing something yeah just street cricket i think uh, one of those lucky ones where i was able to uh, play gully cricket just growing up right in front of my house with my you know brother and my neighbors um, not something the kids here are used to doing but you know something that i grew up uh, doing in india very fortunate for that just being able to expose myself to playing cricket and holding a bat from the age of like six or seven and eventually getting on to some kind of formal coaching at the age of nine and 10. Wow, was that in India, Cindy? Yes, I'm born, brought up in India, uh, moved over to the US late in my uh, life, about 23 years old, something when I moved over here. Wow, so yeah. how, how was that transition, Sindhu? I know like my older brother and my older sister moved here when they were you know, in their older teens, they were like 18, 19, I was probably 10 when I moved here with the family. So I felt a little bit of that change, obviously, but it's it's a difficult, transition right from when you go from India you come here so what was that transition like for you yeah it wasn't easy at all I mean that's not something that I've actually probably spoke in any of my interviews but yes a very difficult transition I must say it's quite intimidating when I moved over here not knowing anybody not having my support system around Um, I got married and moved here Uh, my husband has been living here since he since 2009 so he was my only uh, family that I knew none of my families are are here none of my family is here so definitely a a big change having moved here without any friends having to restart almost my career which uh, restart my life not just a career but just restarting my life at you know 24 25 isn't easy And, you know, I didn't actually move here to play cricket at all. In fact, I moved here without my cricket gears or cricket equipments because I'd actually stopped playing cricket in India at the age of like 22, um, had not played for a couple of years, moved here just, you know, just wanted to explore a new country and see what life, you know, holds uh, for me in this new country. And um, yeah, here here I am after 10 years. Wow, that's that's some story. So... When you moved here, obviously, you know, it's a difficult transition. And so what sparked your interest back into cricket? I know, like you said, you didn't play from 22 to perhaps probably a couple of years that, you know, went missing for you. So what, you know, kind of sparked that interest back into into the game where you're like, man, I, I can actually play the sport professionally. Kind of when did that light bulb go off? I think I did not want to, uh, first of all, I think when I moved over here, I moved on a dependent visa, which did not allow me to pl- uh, um, allow me to work. So Something my husband kept kind of telling me to try and look for something that's going to keep me occupied throughout the day, give me some some kind of, you know, a, a passion to look forward to. 
and he kind of pushed me back to start playing cricket um, because he knew how much it was a big part of my life, uh, you know, until the age of 22. So he was like, why don't you start here? And I think what kind of attracted me towards wanting to play cricket in the U.S. was it was such a social game. It, they didn't, I didn't have an expectation of wanting this to be a profession. Uh, I think all through my uh, playing days from the age of 10 or 11, all I thought about was making that Indian team and playing this as a professionally. So I added a lot of pressure to myself and probably not enjoying it as much as I wanted to towards the end of my India career. So what I look forward to over here in the US was, you know, starting a kind of a clean slate, you know, making my own name in a new country, just enjoying the game, picking that bat again, the reason that I picked up at the age of six and seven, you know, just kind of finding that fun element in the game itself. So I think that's, that's what kind of, you know, attracted me towards wanting to start the game again here. Oh, wow. That's awesome. So it was just the social aspect of it, right? When you moved here, you probably needed to be around people that, you know, enjoyed cricket or played a bit of cricket on the weekend. And I think that's how I even got into cricket here. I came, moved here, didn't play cricket for five years and then saw some cricket at the park and, you know, went out for social things. So it's, it's, it's how I think all of us start here in the U.S., right? So that particular difference from obviously representing India to USA, it's, it's a big difference in it, right? So the, the pathways are different, the, the ability to obviously you know, get yourself out there in India is much tougher than here. So how does that actually, how do you see, you know, U.S. cricket kind of growing that the number of females? I know we had a question from one of the fans, actually, I'm going to bring it up anyway, since I talked about it right now. So at least Lay Jones had, had sent me a question. He said, I would be interested in hearing more about how to grow the overall number of females playing the game. I understand it's around 300 only across the U.S., Second, what are your thoughts on playing multi-sports and the benefits of, say, softball? So he wants to obviously know how, what's the plan of the growth of the female game? I know the system is, you know, a lot more mature in the USA from the female cricket perspective, right? But the, the male side, where as much as I've seen, is not as mature as the female uh, cricketing system. So what, what do you kind of attribute that to? First of all, I think over the past couple of years, I think when we in first introduced the domestic pathway in 2019, 2021, uh, 2021, when we introduced uh, the domestic pathway to what where we have reached today, we've done extremely well in terms of just being able to start this under 15 tournament to introduce that as the first time introduction of an under 15 tournament in our domestic pathway having done under 19 tournaments for a couple of years now we've done a uh, we've done a great job in introducing that so yes it's just 300 when you look at the number but it does sound like uh, it's you know very less you know when compared to other countries but we are constantly growing and you can see that that definitely goes back to USA cricket uh, building and trusting this structure building that structure our domestic pathways out how can we grow the number overall? I have been a firm believer that this can grow when we start doing it more in the grassroots level, introducing the sport in the school systems, college system, being able to retain these players who are currently 15 and 16 year olds when they do not have to make these decisions when they're going into universities, giving them an opportunity to pursue this sport that they love as they move in their education system. Putting that in that school system is what I believe is going to grow the numbers. It's not an easy job. Um, no. Having now, um, having my own Aspire Foundation now wanting to do that, it's not an easy sell as to just going and asking a school to introduce a program like cricket. It does definitely requires a lot of support from the school district, you know, the city, the council, everything that comes in together. I also want to point out that um, USA Cricket did talk about a soft uh, softball initiative. Uh, they started as a softball initiative where they want to do a pilot program in trying to in Missouri to try and run a program pilot program for softball players and introduce them into cricket. So that's a great initiative. So we want to see how probably pick that pilot and see the program and how it's been, how it's you know accepted and how it grows from there. Oh, and it's about multi-sport, something that we, I have been, and as, as a team, all of us, we, we are definitely encouraging our girls to go and play more sport, which allows them to, there, is, there are transferable skills from every sport that you can bring it back to cricket. And what it also does is, 
takes the pressure out of them of that just cricket is their only sport you know just have play sport as you as you grow just keep playing any sport and everything is transferable one great example is ash Bharti, right i mean uh, look at where she is today uh, an athlete who has shown us that you know she can play any sport from tennis to cricket and i saw something just this morning that she's going to be competing in in golf so um there's no there's nobody th- there's nothing to stop you all i think we should definitely be playing um, multi sport in a uh, they are better athletes as well. It just overall development of an athlete, you know, is more when you play multi sports. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree there. I mean, multi sports is, you know, as you said, transferable skills. If you play, let's say, a bit of baseball, you know, here and or a bit of softball in schools, you know, those guys already naturally will have hand and eye ability, some coordination. So there's some obviously technical aspects to the game. But do you yeah. feel like a high school softball player, for example, Sindhu, let's say, there's female opportunities at an equivalent level. Let's just, you know, kind of think about that, right? Let's say if they were equal, would, would the softball player, will, will they be able to transition, obviously, into cricket if they're, let's say, a pro college softball athlete or a semi-pro athlete that, you know, want to switch over to cricket and they see a better opportunity there for them? Do you think that's possible for these types of players? Oh, yeah, 100 po- I'm 100 percent possible. I mean, there is no stopping anyone. Like, I also want to give you an example of how our own girls who are playing cricket now also play sport, also play softball to their school teams. Snick the Paul is one of them. Trisha Bhima and the West Coast. And let's not forget Ritu Singh, who is also a gymnast, right? So we have players who are already proving it to us that they can be multi-sport athletes and also be able to perform not just in one sport, but both as well. And how they've transformed those skills into cricket or taken back cricket skills back to their sport. So that that is that that is something that we've always been off late. I want to say not you know that's an off late. That's something that we've been trying to push the girls to go play a different sport, try a different sport, you know, see what they can bring from that sport to you know to cricket and make cricket more fun and make cricket better as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and the girls obviously they enjoy. I mean, the, the female team that we have here in the Milford Cricket Club are. New Milford Tigers, right? The numbers have grown the last couple of years. We started a very small youth rec program working with the city about 10 years back, right? We had a couple of females show interest. And, you know, once we kind of launched our youth program, we saw that number rise, you know, from the females. So it's obviously just taking initiatives from, you know, people that are in charge of their leagues or their clubs to kind of think about the youth initiatives, right? And and if it's at the core of their mission, you know, we can make a true difference, right? And and that's, again, the mission of this podcast is, is as well as to highlight the, the work that's needed at the grassroots level, the work that you guys have been putting in from Aspire Cricket, you know, because there's not many people who are doing the stuff, you know, that we're doing at the grassroots level. So again, we've worked with their city, we've had some good success, but now what's the next step? We brought up schools, right? We have some summer youth rec programs going on. We're getting support from the city. But now the next step is the schools, uh, which is which is the hardest thing, in my opinion. So how do we kind of tackle that challenge? Or do you do you have any insights in, into that, perhaps that, you know, we can use certain strategies to, to get better results out of our town halls? Well, not something that I yeah, I can just speak out of theory experiences, but not really yeah. practical, practicality, realis- realistically, what can be achieved. Right. I mean, I can. I can say, let's try and do a pilot program uh, within one city that is, you know, allowing us to try out a new sport and see the kind of um, kind of you know, engagement that we get from the kids and from the parents and how much we can, you know, grow the game within a particular city, use that program, pilot program into different cities, right? Um, I mean, we definitely need to try out and see, you know, it's all trial and error. Nobody has done this. And we probably will have will will learn from experiences, but like I'm saying, I think um, getting out there, doing this in the grassroots level is um, definitely key in increasing those numbers. Having said that, what is what next? I mean, most of these programs that we run, even with Aspire, is you know go and um, introduce a game in this new community show them what cricket is about and, you know, just making cricket available and visible to communities that haven't seen them. But what next? I mean, probably need to give them, we have the domestic pathway just which brings them, which is the pathway to get them to the USA national team. But we need a structure, something that is below 
the domestic pathway that is playing kind of school cricket, inter-school cricket, inter-county cricket, inter-city cricket, something that's below that is actually building the numbers up to the domestic pathway and then eventually the national team. So I think having that foundation that is under the domestic pathway, that is key. I think that is something that we have to think through what is the right thing for USA right now. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And I recently interviewed president of Commonwealth Cricket League here in New York. They run a league of about 100 plus teams, right? And the biggest challenges that they've kind of faced, right, is the education of, as you're saying, people not knowing about it, people are not sure you know, what cricket is. So what you guys are doing obviously brings education about the sport, you know, to, to the masses. And, you know, on the second end, we've got a World Cup coming here, right? We've got um, major league heavy investments, minor league heavy investments. So do you think that's going to make a, a big dent in, in actual educating, you know, our offices and and people that are in charge about the game and what work needs to be done? And, and what do you, how do you foresee that kind of happening? Like, I think World Cup's going to be huge. Absolutely. I'm not sure how it's going to pan out or, or what the effects are going to be, but your take on um, the impact. Absolutely. I think, yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be a great impact into cricketing community throughout the U.S. Um, well, a few things, right? First of all, something like a World Cup, we're going to get visibility throughout the world. So that's there's visibility of that. And there's infrastructure improvement, something that we've all been asking for. We need infrastructure. We need proper grounds. We need to be able to have in you know, stadiums. We need to be able to host countries. So I think all of that will be made possible through this World Cup, through the World Cup, with the money coming into the system and building us in a kind of a platform and the foundation through which we can only go upwards from here, right? So I think definitely from that point of view, having World Cup here is probably at, at this point of time, I think it's the right move for the USA. I can only see this getting better for us in terms of, you know, growing the numbers, growing the visibility and uh, building the community, cricket community up and across. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously you being the cricket, you know, USA women's team captain, I'm sure you feel a sense of responsibility as well, right? To grow the female game across the states and all the work you guys are doing with Aspire Cricket is truly remarkable, guys. I'm going to I'm gonna link, um, you know, Aspire Cricket's page and their website in the, in the description, guys. Make sure to go ahead, check it out, like the page, support Aspire Cricket and, you know, the work that's being done across you know, different cities to grow the female game. It's, it's you know, something that we all need to support. So again, um, we need more of this kind of programs, right? So any kind of message for people out there that might be thinking about joining the movement, um, Sindhu, you know, to, to kind of help the cause and, and kind of drive them in the right direction? Yeah, I think something that I probably want to uh, bring up here is it's not, it's not easy. We all are, we all have professional lives. We have, you know, uh, we have family. We also play cricket kind of actively as well. So we wear different hats during the day. But uh, when it comes to giving back to the community, it just takes, you know, a few hours, you know, in a month, you know, it's it's just an investment about giving an hour to go into a community and just introduce the game and, you know, playing with the girls for an hour. It's actually fun when you do this, you know, kind of fun active. It's, it's just fun giving back. We all have played this cricket. We know this sport and we know how much, it is given to us and we know how fun it is when we are on the field, when we play the game, just go out there, spread the love, you know, spread the game. And I think that's, that's, that's all I can ask for and just go there and play the game that we all love. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, that's what it's all about having fun and enjoying making friends and, and truly, you know, mm -hmm. uh, building the community. Cause obviously it's the support that communities kind of have for each other as well, right? Within our small cricketing communities, it's such a big difference in our lives as well, because, you know, we look forward to to our community things whenever they're going around in cricket. So not, it's not just about coming out and playing cricket, right? It's about obviously being part of a social community, being part of group within your area that that's uh, looking to, you know, build a love for the game as well as, you know, build the right type of mindset into, into children, disciplines, so that's mostly where the difference is made, right? In the kids' lives and, and, and instilling uh, different kind of qualities in them through, uh, you know, different cricket programs. Um, I'm going to bring up another question, Sajad's question. I know, Sindhu, you manage, you know, work, family, life, kids, cricket, captaincy. So I think this question is along those lines, right? Like, how do you how do you do everything? Like, how, how, do, how does, uh, how do you prioritize, obviously, your 
your, your skill sets and what you need to do at what time. And obviously it would require family support, your support from your husband. So how does all that kind of pan out in Sindhu's world? That's a tough one, but uh, yeah. I don't think I've mastered this yet. I think it's something that um, I'm still, you know, working through. Uh, it's not, it's not an easy thing easy thing to do and all of us playing a uh, professional sport over here in the US especially cricket i want to say we are all uh, juggling different priorities on a regular basis it's just not me um, yes you know uh, when it comes to the things that you mentioned yeah everybody goes through it but i couldn't have done this without the support of my you know husband uh, you know he probably at times has had to over the past 5 years i have one one kid uh, who's 5 years old now for the past 5 years uh play the role of the single parent being the primary parent having to sacrifice probably the things that he wanted to do just so that i am able to achieve what i have i don't think it's really possible without having that support system even when it comes to my mom who had to um actually literally stay with us for a year after i gave birth to be you know take care of my son so that i could actively go back and playing you know i was back on the field uh eight weeks after eight or nine weeks after wow. delivery to compete in a selection game for so uh, it's it's really not my success i don't believe it is it i couldn't have done any of this without the support of many people like i mean i'm just talking about husband my husband and my family but i got to talk about even the community over here in the bay area when they have fed me food because i didn't have the time to cook you know they literally have fed me food or even you know babysit <laughs> my my son when i take him to play yeah. games and all they did was you just go play on the you know on the field just leave the kid with us so i've had support throughout um you know i've just been lucky i think i've just been lucky enough to have that kind of a support let's not forget um even the companies that we work for have to truly believe in my passion to be able to uh, you know support me in this it's not um families i feel like it it, it is more granted that they will support you but in a way when I mean, it comes to the work environment and my uh, my managers over the years who've played a role the companies that i work for have played a role in being able to successfully for me to go out there and be myself on the field forget everything else you know different uh, hats that i wear during the day and be myself a lot of people play different roles in this there is no formula that i have already yeah. figured out that that is the right way to do it but there's something that i always do on every day in the morning when i wake up which um i follow religiously now is um i have three priorities or four priorities in my life that is family four different um hats i probably wear as a cricketer i am a mother i'm a wife and also a professional you know uh, professional yeah. work i mean a career yeah. as a professional so i sit down you know as and as i wake up try to put in my hat and see what's the priority number some days my priority one is being a mother and the second priority is being a cricketer second third is you know something else but yeah. it this changes there are times when my priority one as being the mother is priority number 4 which is the last priority yeah. and i i'm completely fine with it today there is i don't have to feel guilty about it because i know as mother sometimes i'm talking to the mothers out there yeah. it is not you cannot be 100% mother yeah. at all times it is okay and they will turn out fine i mean i yeah. my son is completely fine so <laughs> i think um able to recognize that i have these different hats and at times i might not be able to be 100% that person that four different person that i have to be it is fine with me and i have accepted that and my you know my husband has accepted it too and i tell him today hey by the way today this are my priorities so i set my priorities right on the morning and it can change yeah. during the day but it's fine yeah. but i'm i play that in my mind to make sure that i am aligned with what i want to be on a particular day yeah absolutely and and as you said you know like it's all your successes and everything it's not just you know your soul journey it's also support from people around you and and you know work and your managers it's it's such a key thing obviously right to have that support so you can go out there and and you know represent the USA and and perform at the top level. You know, obviously as a as a captain too. So you you mentioned only four roles and do I think you you forgot captaincy, which is the fifth role, right? So 
how do you <laughs> i'm gonna ask you so like obviously cricket is is you know when you're captain of the team you have responsibility to kind of you know make certain decisions keeping you know the interest of the team at the top front and center right so and obviously there's different sorts of personality in the team there's different types of people that you have to deal with from a different perspective so how do you how do you manage that how do you balance you know dealing with different types of people and different uh, personalities to you know obviously get the best out of those players yeah i mean i i've led this team for about seven to eight years now um yeah. the current team has all of these kids that i have grown up playing with uh which makes it a little all all the more easier to be able to lead them i have seen them since they were like nine or ten years old uh, wow. and now today for them to be playing along with us it's just it's so much more easier i think um the leader of the team is as good as what the team is and you know i i can i can they make me look good you know they like me they make me look better on the field or even off the field they we could have a bad day on the field in terms of the results but i think the culture that we want to build out there we're all aligned on what we want to be uh, we want to be able to be a team that is um, we accept each other for who we are and we give them the, um, you know, just just building that safe environment where they can be themselves, go out there and express themselves and be themselves. And I think it's taken a few years for us to reach here where we've reached. But currently, I think the team culturally, we're all kind of aligned to where we want to see this team grow. And um, of course, the management system that have been around us, um, be the coach, you know, when Julia Price was around, the kind of support she provided and the confidence that she instilled in me to be the leader that I am today. I definitely have to talk about the role that she has played in my life has been, I have talked about it a few times. It's been great. I think Julia Price has played a huge role in making me the leader that I am today. And uh, over the years, of course, we had Charlotte now playing the role of the interim head coach during LA tournament. So everybody has played a part in making it, you know, the team that is today and, and of course, making me look better on the field because we have an excellent group of people there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it looks like you've nurtured a lot of these youngsters that are playing with you right now. So I'm sure it makes leading them easier because they naturally look up to you, right? They're naturally, they've been around you. They're used to you. And um, they, absolutely. I mean, I, I love the the entire thing about it. So, you know, what other challenges do you face do you, or any, like as a leader um, of obviously developing Cricket Nation? You know, I know there's numbers and you have to, you know, go out there and and grow the game while also representing USA and working and everything. So um, any particular challenges that kind of come off your mind that you're like oh man if we can kind of you know fix this it'll it'll yeah, be a little I, bit better for us i think what i have been uh, kind of advocating for and you know maybe almost you know begging for is you know having more international exposure for us you know as a team uh wanting to play more international games more competitive games against uh, teams that are ranked higher than us um gives us an opportunity to um, challenge ourselves against good teams, right? Uh, having not having to meet them first time in a World Cup qualifiers. We want to be able to play all around, um, all around the year, some kind of an international games, which will only make us better. If you see our performances in any of the World Cup qualifiers or a, in a global qualifiers, we start to look better, get better towards the end of the tournament. While we've lost most of our time in the beginning, just trying to adjust or, you know, make those changes because these are not the, you know, uh, not the same level that we are used to playing throughout the year. So we yeah. tend to start doing better towards the end. So I think what as a as a team and as USA Cricket and everything, we have to see an opportunity right here to be able to provide enough uh, exposure to the entire team to be able to go out there and be their best you know prepare them the best way possible with more international game yeah absolutely and as you can only improve if you play against better players right and and, and the more exposure we get against better players against better teams across the board not just for the female team as well but for the males team as well because we don't get a lot of cricket you know from the national i mean we get some cricket obviously but not playing against the teams that you know, that would give us a little more exposure to to the players. So that's definitely something, you know, to to think about for USA Cricket to develop, obviously more programs for the game, more investment needs to come in into the women's game to, 
you know, obviously be able to plan these types of things. Cause at the end of the day, I'm sure, you know, these guys will nail it down to money, right? Where's the money? Where's the funding coming from for any type of growth that's needed? Cause that's all, all we hear, right? <laughs> when we go to the city hall, oh, how are we going to fund this? It's the first yeah. thing that usually pops up and anything that we kind of approach with. So from funding perspective, do you think like we need to do different type of fundraisers, maybe something more creative that than we're already doing? I know we do you know, like ticket sales for like raffle tickets and stuff like that to, to actually support the game. But do you think any there's any other ideas that we can potentially do? That's a very good question. Having a 501c myself, now nonprofit, you know, there's something yeah. that we got to definitely put our heads together and try to figure out how, how do we raise funds for, you know, for a, for a sport like cricket. And knowing that USA is, is, is a, is a, sporting country right i mean it's known for you know being a sporting country how how can we um attract investors to be able to do it on i think we we all have to put our heads together to try and think through what could be the best way to move forward in this yes i do understand that usa cricket's biggest uh, issue right now is funding but um like i said it's it has to be a collective effort from all of us to try and figure this out. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, this is like the part of this, you know, conversation and other conversations that, you know, we've been doing is to again pick the brains of relevant people like yourselves, like people that are in charge, right? Or not even in charge, but that are involved in the game. That know, hey, there's certain things that we can do so collectively we can get the community together. Um, you know, because again, that's I, the only way I feel it. The improvement comes is again if we come together as a community. So bringing that community together is should be like on top of our list from the grassroots level. Yeah, I was I was just going to mention that I'm particularly very uh, excited for the under 15 tournament that's you know r- wow. really introduced uh, this year because currently there are a lot of 13 and 14 year olds and 15 year olds uh currently playing cricket all over and do not qualify to play uh any icc tournament because there is a restriction and there's a requirement of 15 years old but starting this under 15 tournament is only going to uh, increase those numbers in the which eventually from under 15 they move on to under 19 and and that's what i uh, grew up playing right i played under 16 for seven years uh, and yeah. then moved on to play under 19 and uh, and seniors and by the time i had already played three or four years and the kind of exposure of under 16 i had i was already prepared for the under 19 and seniors so this is only going to make cricket better the competitive level competition level is going to increase which uh which is going to push the players you know in each of these age group level under 19s are going to be challenged by the under 15s then we'll be challenged in the you know in the senior group so i think it's only for the better um only for the better we just have to make sure that we are thinking through what's below the domestic uh, pathway how do we increase the schooling and cities and you know, you know colleges yeah. how do we do that yeah and absolutely and and um you know there was another idea from um last time i got, i had interviewed uh, you know, uh, Headley, I guess, the guy who sent the question earlier. So he was part of our club. He's from New Zealand and Australia, right? So over mm-hmm. there, you know, he mentioned that, um, you know, there's there's no difference between like a female cricketer or a male cricketer from an early age, from like five year on to like at least 15 to 17. They're playing cricket like together. They're training together. They're, you know, kind of practicing together. Obviously, when you play, you know, together, it's going to level up your game too. And that's, what's how it's thought about it over there so the australian female players the kiwi female players they grow up automatically like you did how playing street cricket with you know guys and and your brothers they play they play same thing within their clubs and stuff like that and they're you know do it together so the game actually ends up improving more so do you think that's something that u.s cricket can actually focus on and have like some combined sessions with the male and female teams and have an academy of sorts where you know male cricketers and female cricketers can go work on their game at this academy which is already happening right so all of us currently already play in an under 15 under 16 under 17 leagues in in the bay area at least we um all of the girls are part of the leagues around over here playing against youth cricket 
um, and also men's cricket, men's league, in fact, on a regular basis, we play against the boys and we on, on a regular basis, we, you know, tra- they travel to play against the boys as well. Yeah. There is MILC Junior where uh, yeah. the girls play in the under 15 teams along with the boys. Wow. Um, that awesome. is already happening. And um, it's all all throughout I, I believe everybody around the, the entire nation today actually the only way for us to get competitive cricket 365 days is to be able to compete in this boys tournament or the youth tournament but eventually we have to build the number to be able to play just uh, girls yeah. cricket there is a lot more that you get out of playing in girls cricket Imagine the confidence and the uh, empowerment and uh, the co- and the comfort level for all of these thirteen-year-old, yeah. fourteen-year-old, fifteen-year-old when they come and play amongst girls against girls. We have seen that difference. We have yeah. felt it ourselves when we have girls when we play just just girls cricket versus girls versus boys cricket. You ask any of those girls, they enjoy playing girls cricket more because they that gives them that makes them feel you know they, they, that makes them feel like they're part of a community, they're part of a yeah. part of a moment. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know the girls and boys, obviously. So they're playing separately when you guys do this kind of thing, um, you know. So it's boys versus girls, or is it more like a co-ed setup? Yeah. So it's there is combined teams. There are girls versus boys teams. So something that we do in the Bay Area as well is um, on a regular basis we have one women's team, a uh, girls team play against the under fifteen, under sixteen boys team on a regular basis, uh, just so we can keep. Uh, our competitive level going but the other girls who are under 15 under 16 or even under 13 play in the boys leagues in the boys team as part of the team absolutely yeah no that's good that's that's what i wanted to kind of hear and because you know i want the girls to obviously not feel like if there isn't a female team that they can't go out there and play right if they are interested if they're if they're interested in picking up a bat and going out there you know feel free to go out and play for a men's league team on a weekend, you know, in a club. Cause you know, we had a, a young player, 15 year old player, Izzy Slade Jones. You might know her very talented, yeah. young, fast bowler. Um, you know, so she came mm-hmm. when they moved from new, uh, New Zealand, very talented kid, you know, she played with our league teams to improve her game and, you know, her game improved playing against obviously, uh, you know, players that are around her. So I think it's a really key way that we can use to improve the skill levels of, of, um, you know, younger players to have them play with, you know, some experienced guys or even a combination like co- a co-ed league of sorts, you know, where you kind of just do it for fun, but to also improve the game as well, potentially on a Saturday or something like a fun little co-ed league, right? Where you can get more females into into the cricket just from interest perspective. Agreed. And I think that's already kind of happening in all, all over all the leagues in the U.S. and um, which I kind of, um, which we appreciate, and also over the over a few years down the lane, I think we we definitely should have all of the leagues have at least one women's team representative, a full team of fifteen, and which can you know which can eventually build up our numbers too. That that's something that BCCI did in two thousand five, which I was part of, uh, where every state had to have a. Uh, a women's team and yeah. participate otherwise the men's team weren't allowed to participate in the Ranji trophy so that's awesome um, i like that idea <laughs> i really i really like yeah, that I idea <laughs> i don't think we can go to you know that level but i'm just saying that you know there should be some kind of you know uh, eventually reach there where every league has a has female a program at least a, a female program running yeah, absolutely and the one challenge obviously right Acro- i mean it's mostly here in the northeast and maybe maybe midwest not probably where you are in california right it's the game time mm-hmm. right and, the, and mm-hmm. obviously we only play cricket you know from april until september october maximum so we don't that's that's our cricket season right so in mm-hmm. the off season we're just on either doing indoors or you know yeah. just kind of practicing and things like that there's not a lot of games or tournaments time going on so for that's a challenge right for uh, female players living in this region how can how can they improve uh, within the northeast region i'm saying right because it's tough i'm sure in your area you can play cricket all year round so this goes back to our first conversation about multi-sports you know uh have them you know we can we can have them play in a softball they get on think you know or any other sport 
that they can continue playing during their off season, which eventually they're going to be able to bring it back to into cricket. So that's that's like a perfect opportunity for them to try out multi sport, right? I mean, um, it's it's fine, and I don't think at most of our domestic pathways are during the summer, and which is not going to bre- take them out of other sport that they would be playing. Yeah. that they could still continue playing cricket as well. So I think that gives us a uh, good opening for them to try out other sports at that time. I was talking to a, a colleague who lives in Chicago and I was yeah. about to complain about uh, my um, the the rain and the cold. And she just said, let me stop you right there. I'm from Chicago. And I had to stop talking. And yeah. I knew <laughs> I can't do anything. <laughs> she was like, it's minus you know, 23. And I was like, okay, sorry. Not talking anymore. That's too funny. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. It's not fun living in the Northeast, guys. All right, guys. If you're just joining us, make sure to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel. We're going to be doing a rapid fire round with Sindhu coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. Before that, Sindhu, let's take a couple more fan questions that we had lined up. So the next question I'm going to bring up is from Nihal Kocher. He's one of our under 19 players from, you know, the New Milford Cricket Club and playing for Northeast region. So he had this question for you. What leadership lessons and or skills have you learned on and off the cricket field being captain of the USA women? That's a that's a big one. I think I'm constantly learning. But one of the things that I have learned or still learning to work through uh, it is my area of improvement is having a check over my emotions uh, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually have done better over the years now. Uh, there is there are a few op- there are a few times when the bowlers have complained like. Uh, since don't look at my face I'm just like yeah. scared just looking at how you're reacting when I'm yeah. bowling but compared to now I have definitely over the years uh, been able to have a check over my emotions um, um, it's easy to get carried away uh, and yeah. you know react to the results but understanding that there's a process to everything and if the process is done right um, eventually you will get the results if anything I can give my my younger self and advice would be that, you know, um, the results will happen. Just try and focus on the process. If the process isn't going right, try to see how you can um, make adjustments to those processes rather than having to worry too much about the results. Absolutely. What great advice from Sindhu there, guys. Let's take another question. Nihal, I hope that answers your question. Paul Singh. Oh, well, it looks like he had a couple of questions. But okay, so what do you believe? is the greatest challenge most athletes are facing today. I'm going to talk about what's probably the greatest challenge most of our uh, women cricketers or the girl cricketers are facing yeah. today. So I think that is more relevant uh, from, yeah. for this particular conversation. So yeah. I think the one of the biggest challenge today um, for our girls is the transition from um, cricket world into their education world. I think that's probably the biggest challenge I can see, the transition. Something that I think as USA Cricket, we got to you know, support them in terms of any kind of mental health kind of support uh, that is required in that transition. It is it is not easy. Um, I can tell you with my own personal experiences Every time when we go away for a tour or it go away for a tournament, be it a three-day tournament or a five-week tournament, you are in this bubble of an athlete life and a cricketer yeah. life. You put aside everything else that you are and just be in this bubble where you're made to feel like you know a hero or over you know you you're not an average person you are made to feel you're you know above a normal average people just because you're an athlete you get that kind of attention yeah. fast forward five weeks down the line after the tournament you're coming back and uh in the flight and you're back to the house mm-hmm. it's a quick transition back into being a student you know being a mother you know having to go back to my prof- in a professional uh career it's it's a quick change in a matter of few hours. I don't think we don't we talk enough about this transition, and I think uh, we got to support the athletes today in any kind of support that we can give them yeah. in terms of how to handle this transition. That for me is like probably the biggest challenge that we are facing today. Yeah, I mean, with all the hats that you wear, I'm sure you can't. I mean, it's it's difficult. I'm sure to just go from you know, going to play cricket, to going to work and then being a mom and then being a husband and being, 
you know, a daughter and, you know, so there's a lot of things I'm sure that you have to obviously do. And it's very hard, um, you know, as you said, so. For the years, I am 35 today. So it took me a few years to understand yeah. this transition um, and eventually understand how to deal with this transition. Uh, but it, it has taken me a few years to reach here. But some of our some of our players today are having to deal with it. So I think, you know, something that we got to support them in terms of like how to balance life, you know, being able to provide them enough resources to be able to cope with that, I think is probably the biggest challenge. Absolutely. And and I'm sure that would be your advice to aspiring young girls as well that are looking to pursue cricket is to obviously balance your education and, and uh, you know, find the right balance between sports and and how to transition because mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the questions and i think you just answered it so i wanted to kind of bring it up sindhu what message would you like to give to obviously the cricket community here in the usa and around the world let them know how they can support you know what you're doing with aspire cricket for female cricket youth cricket well i think um that's a tough one to give one advice away but what in in all of the context that you just said but what i can say is to my fellow um, cricketers that I have played with and who have the passion and who've played the sport and who have under who have you know got so much back from the sport is to get out there and you know support the sport and spread it you know in any way that you can and be there and um, go out in the community and serve back you know cricket yeah, absolutely man you guys heard from Sindhu let's give it back guys to the community a cricket community we all need your help growing the game here um, at the grassroots level and what Aspire Cricket's doing, what New Milford Cricket's doing. Um, you know, we have to get more of these organizations together um, to, to bring together a change, obviously, right? So again, Sindhu, it was a great conversation with you. Are you ready for this rapid fire round? Three, two, one, let's go. Favorite cricket ground? Tough one. Something that comes to my mind very quickly right now, Dubai. Dubai. Early the, bird the or night owl? Early bird. Early bird. Favorite vacation destination? I haven't been there yet, but uh, definitely want to go with my family to New Zealand and Australia. Nice. Favorite food? Favorite food to have um, when I've had a good day on the field will be biryani. Best cricketing advice ever received? Go out there and be brave and take the risk, calculated risk. Cool. Favorite cricket shot? My favorite shot would be a cover drive. Proudest cricketing moment? Both the times that we won the America's uh, first time in 2019 in Florida, um, second in Mexico, and third in LA. Awesome. Dream opponent in a cricket match? Uh, I want to play against India at some point of time. Awesome. Most challenging team you've faced so far? Against Zimbabwe, 50 overs qualifiers in Zimbabwe wow. um, in 2021. Um, great game. It went all over the uh, all, all the way towards the you know wow. ninth wicket. You know, we lost the game, but the kind of support the Zimbabwe had at one point of time. We couldn't hear each other on the wow. field when I was trying to give, uh, you know, instructions to people like, you know, to the bowlers. They just couldn't hear. That's the kind of support they had. Favorite movie? So many. I think I've answered this question once. Uh, I would say Pursuit of Happiness. Cricket role model growing up? Raul Dravid and Adam Gilchrist. Cricketing achievements you cherish? I would pick again the T20 tournaments um that we've won the americas if not cricket then what sport i'm telling you you can ask all of my friends they will vouch for this that i can't play any other sport so <laughs> i <laughs> think i'm just people stick about multi-sport athletes and do i'm sure you can pick up a I, badminton racket or something you know I, I wish somebody had told me as growing up to play another sport, but um, something else that I grew up playing while, you know, as a kid was the badminton, not something that we play too much in the US, but yeah. um, badminton is something else that I actually do enjoy playing. So I think that's... Yeah, I think sport, in any but... gullies, right, where there's a cricket kind of a, a scene, there's always badminton, there's always hockey field hockey being yeah. played at, at times right there's maybe even like pit two. i don't know if you've ever played pit two where you hit the rocks you know you stack up those oh, rocks we, and <laughs> we, call that as Lagori. We, we say lagori in south india oh my god okay, that's yeah. that's a great yeah i remember yeah, we used to call like, it pit two, having, so we used to play a lot of that <laughs> yeah i remember like getting hit with those you know those rubber balls oh, remember when yeah, we yeah. played and then it would hurt it, <laughs> the, in the team oh my god yes i remember this we used to call it as lagori uh back home good to know yeah, awesome yeah. we called it something else in pakistan so forget i said that so last <laughs> one sindhu hidden talent let the world know your hidden talent if i start laughing 
I can't stop and oh, I have a very <laughs> um my teammates will watch well. Yeah. Oh, it's man. it's a yeah. That's cool. Well, I mean, you should have told me earlier, so I would try to make you laugh a little more throughout the conversation. <laughs> you know, you, you but... wouldn't want that. Trust me, you wouldn't want oh. me uh, starting off my, you know, laugh oh, here. Cool. <laughs> History. Awesome, laugh awesome. Here. No, no, that's fine. Awesome. Sindhu, thank you so much again for joining us, guys. It's been a wonderful conversation with Sindhu. Again, if you guys are just joining us, thank you for sticking to the end of this conversation. We've had a wonderful conversation with Sindhu about USA cricket, female cricket, growing the game at a grassroots level. You know, to all the female players that are looking to pick up a cricket bat, looking to get involved, you know, Sindhu is an example right in front of you guys. My message would be to go out there, be part of the community, you know, follow Aspire Cricket, you know, follow what what other leagues are doing in your area to support the youth cricket and be part of this growth and uh you know let's grow c- cricket together here in the u.s sindhu again thank you so much for joining us it was a wonderful conversation any last words for the viewers before we uh kind of call it quits and sign off i know we've gone over the hour mark yeah. already i've said a lot already i think uh first of all thank you nabil and thank you for everything that you do uh to support uh cricket over here and also thank you for inviting me i've thoroughly enjoyed myself for the past one one hour talking to you Absolutely. Same here. It was lovely. It was lovely. And I, uh, I would love to see you out here in New Milford one day working with some of the some of the female cricketers here. And they all look up to you. So, um, you know, definitely want to invite you out one day when, uh, you know, it makes sense to, for you to come out and, and uh, you know, be part of the, the youth and female cricket here and, and kind of take a look for yourself what we've built. So it would, would be awesome to have you here one day. Hopefully that does happen soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sindhu. Much appreciated. And thank you guys so much. Watching till the end, Nabil and Sindhu from the Reverse Scoop, signing off. Have a great night, everybody.